speakers coming up and then we will, we will have some music. So the next speaker is... So the next speaker is Richard Williams, member of QP3903 and a Socialist Action member. And Richard is going to be talking on war and resistance and other related issues. Thank you, Mama D, Charles, Elizabeth, and Jackie. I'm Richard, I study Canadian history, and I am a Newfoundlander. Yes! <laughs> the Boer War was fought for two main reasons. Suzerainty, British control of foreign policy, in South Africa control of internal policy, and ideology maintaining status quo Pax Britannica. Canadians, in particular, fought for idealism and patriotism, loyalism to Britain, and anti-American protections. For Canada, resistance came from French speakers who saw the Boers much like themselves, farmers trying to make do in an oppressive government system. Now between 1900 and 1914, the population of Canada exploded. We were looking to populate the West from five million to seven million. Many were Austrian, German, and Ukrainian because they were good farmers. As World War I started, we passed the War Measures Act. It was enforced from 1914 to 1920. During that time, it was used to imprison Canadians, mostly of German, Ukrainian, and Slavic descent. We legally labeled them enemy aliens as unnaturalized citizens and did not allow them to volunteer or enlist. 8,579 were imprisoned without trial for four years. Many more lost legal rights, property, money, and voting franchise. There was real patriotic fervor in English-speaking Canada, to which volunteers flocked. However, Quebec still viewed the Canadian Army as an English-speaking institution. In context, French speakers were still enraged at a ban on French language instruction in 1913. Over 400,000 volunteers, 70% were recent British immigrants, 1 in 20 were French-speaking. Considered by 1917, jobs were plentiful at home. Canada could no longer field adequate reserves and passed a conscription bill, the Military Services Act, in July. It had support of all English-speaking parliamentarians and opposition of all French-speaking. Conscription became law in May 1980. Uh, in August, in May 1918, there was a man arrested for lack of conscription papers. The local army office looted, destroyed, following days, days of riots. On April 1st, the army was sent into the city of Montreal. Demonstrators were dispersed by rock throwing, with four killed and many more wounded. During this time in BC, Albert Ginger Goodwin, affectionately called for his red, bright hair, was a coal miner, union organizer, and draft dodger, who was killed by a policeman in BC wilderness. It basically sparked the one day long Vancouver general strike. Mm -hmm. Which takes us to the Winnipeg general strike in May and June 1919. Talks with employers and building and metal trades fell through and the Winnipeg Trades and Labor Council called for a general strike. The next day, 30,000 people walked out of their jobs. Both retail trade and the train stopped. Then more joined in public, sec public sector employees, firemen, postal workers, telephone operators, waterworks employees, and even policemen joined their private sector workers. The Citizens Committee of 1000, a group of manufacturing owners, politicians, and bankers, called for no concessions to strikers. Canada's Ministers of Labor and Interior both met with the Citizens Committee, but not the Strike Committee. Federal workers were ordered back to work. Definition of criminal sedition was broadened, and all recent immigrants, even those of British descent, were threatened with deportation. The RCMP broke up the strike line with a charge. Jump to 1931. Employment was out of control, so the government planned public works. They were designed to be temporary, and employ as many men as possible for moral, not necessarily economic reasons. Yet, too many were still out of work, with no employment insurance. The idea in theory was to make work camps. In numbers, there were 144 across the country, for over 170,000 people, which lasted four years, paying, paying 50 cents per man per day. There were 359 work disturbances over the four years. The problems were mostly adequate medical inner unhappiness, but also food quality, flies, cold weather, and arbitrary discipline. Strikes didn't work because politically work was considered a privilege and there was constant demand to enter the camps. Plus, there was lack of coordination with few exceptions. 
such as the Ontawadawa Trek, which is where in 1935, 1500 camp workers in BC struck and boarded or commandeered trains and trucks mm -hmm. and headed for Ottawa. In April, they occupied a Hudson's Bay store, a museum, and a library. Their May Day in Vancouver had 20,000 people. In July, the trek was quelled by police in the Regina riot, where a policeman was killed, 300, 130 rioters, over 300 were arrested. Canada now has a professional full-time discipline, fully benefited army, not disbanded in peacetime, and in service to democratically elected representatives, as it should be. And we can be proud of that. We can also be proud that we have the freedom in this space to recount and criticize history in recognizance that a worker, that there is a worker on both ends of the bayonet. Thank you for your time. Thank you, comrade. Okay, our next speaker is comrade Mitchell Shore, a leading socialist action member. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the treatment of Jews, and I'll move through um, the Holocaust. I'm going to move through uh, to radicalization of um, students in the 1960s. Uh, up until eco-socialism and, and all of that. In the 1930s, at the start of Nazi persecution, Canada had the worst record of any Western country concerning the efforts to save Jews. Canada's policy during this time was summed up by an immigration agent who, when asked how many Jews would be allowed into Canada, replied, none is too many. Hmm. 1939 saw the most horrific instance of this anti-Semitic attitude. That was when Canadian officials refused to allow more than 900 Jewish refugees aboard the SS St. Louis to land on our shores. The ship was then forced to return to Europe, where 250 of those refugees later died in concentration camps. Canada's elite actively rejected <laughs> proposals to help Jewish refugees. During the Holocaust, Canada accepted 5,000 Jews. Compare this to the over 200,000 Jews accepted by the United States. World War II also saw the reintroduction of the War Measures Act. It defined Germans and Italians as enemies and outlawed the Communist Party and Trotskyists. Mm. It enforced conscription and censored the press. Anti-war activists were hounded and arrested. People were forced to register and report to the RCMP. And one of the first actions under the act was to detain 700 Jewish refugees. This was at the request of British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. He believed that there might be terrorists in the group. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Later, the act was expanded to intern thousands of Japanese Canadians. The working class were also not immune. The federal government, while rewarding capitalists with lucrative contracts, froze workers' wages, limited the right to strike, and used troops to break up those strikes. The act, as Kerry mentioned, um, was also used to steal the land of the Chippewas of Kettle and Stony, Stony Point First Nation. The military forcibly removed the residents. Buildings and burial grounds were destroyed in order to establish Camp Ipperwash. Under the terms of the act, the military could only use the land until the end of the war. However, the lands were not returned until last year. In 1995, also as Kerry mentioned, Dudley George, an unarmed Stony Point protester was murdered by the OPP there. Now there were some positive developments in this time. Uh, the, common, uh, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation was founded. The CCF aimed to alleviate the suffering that workers and farmers had to endure under capitalism. In the 1993 uh, Regina Manifesto outlined a number of goals, including public ownership of key industries, universal health care, public pensions, and unemployment insurance. The manifesto was also very clear on its position on war. It stated, we must stand against all participation in imperialist wars. Canada must refuse to be entangled in any more wars fought to make the world safe for capitalism. Mm. Sadly, those inspiring words were betrayed. In 1939, as Canada declared war, the CCF voted to support the government. It is, however, very likely had they been given a say that a majority of the CCF's members would have opposed the war. The CCF's support for the war was the beginning of a steady move to the right and away from its socialist roots. 
1961, the CCF joined forces with the trade union movement to create the new Democratic Party. The idea was that the NDP would present a serious uh, alternative, political alternative, and that the Labour Congress would be able to deliver the vote. The election of minority governments, liberal minority governments, in 1963 and 65 <coughs> depended on NDP support to survive. This led to Medicare, to pension plans, and to a national safety net. Unfortunately, this was the progressive peak for the Canadian government. Uh, this was followed by a steady scaling back of the, the, uh, uh, the gains that workers had achieved. The 1950s saw the reconstruction of Europe and Japan under capitalism and the expansion, the expansion of Stalinism across Eastern Europe. It was the beginning of McCarthyism and the Red Scare. Mm. But the 1960s were different. Workers realized that dissent was legitimate and that social change was, was both possible and necessary. There was the campaign for nuclear disarmament, movements to end European colonialism, and the revolution in Cuba. Cuba was a victory for democracy, for internationalism, for human solidarity, and above all, it was a victory for socialism. And it was felt in Canada. Canadians also <coughs> felt inspiration in the United States. Many Canadians took part in the civil rights movement for racial justice both here and south of the border. But a huge factor in the radicalization of young people was the Vietnam War. Mm. People were sickened by the unending lies, by the napalm bombs destroying villages, and by the horrors that they could witness on television. People began to question the class nature of society. Other important social movements rose in the 1960s. Movements for feminism, for gay liberation, and of course struggles for indigenous people's rights and for environmental protection. Now central to the socialist action program uh, is the fight for eco-socialism. And this includes the following elements. The nationalization of key sectors of the economy, the immediate replacement of fossil fuels with renewable energy, dismantling the polluting war machine used to support in, uh, imperialism, and conscripting the wealth of the capitalist pirates. And this is really the only way to fund the radical energy transition that we need so desperately. So as you can see, here's why we ought to be rejecting the Canada 150 celebrations. And on July 1st, I joined together, I proudly marched with more than 200 people who attended the Idle No More protest at a picnic um, hosted by the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. The protesters demanded immediate justice for indigenous people. There can be no reconciliation without restitution. It's also why I believe it's also why I believe that socialism is our only hope for survival. The capitalist system of exploitation, of oppression, and environmental catastrophe must go. The future of our humanity depends on it. And that's why I urge you, I urge you to join with us in this effort. Join Socialist Action today. We need you. The capitalist system has created huge problems, and only a socialist revolution can solve them. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade. Now for a change of pace, we're going to bring forward a federal worker, singer-songwriter, good friend, our brother and comrade, Glenn Ornblast. There's no microphone, right? No, so don't worry. Sorry, you, no. You'll have to listen hard. <laughs> but um, it's inspiring to be here with so many other uh, fellow human beings and workers and people of all kinds who are fighting for social justice. So I thank you all, and uh, it's a privilege to play for you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, is a song about um, a woman who lived on Bloor Street during the 90s. Her name was Mary, and she was always dressed in black, and she was bent, she was an old lady around 70, bent over at a very, at a really extreme 45 degree angle, because she had uh, scoliosis in the spine. So this is about her. I came to know her a little bit, and uh, it's it's a little bit of her story. It's called Mary.
was in a bus shelter at the corner of Church and Queen. She says in broken English she got nowhere else to be. She's from a town in Germany. She left before the war. And Mary's only crime is being poor. Her husband was a tailor. He had to stay behind. He tried to get his parents out. But Mary thinks they died. Now she spends the nights alone. Freezing in the cold, and Mary's only crime is growing old. Whoa, people, is anybody free? Long as some folks have too much, and some don't have. down shopping car says she ain't been well for a while she motions to her heart I offer her a coffee and maybe a dollar or two she says thank you dear I don't know Church and Queen because it fit the rhymes. But <laughs> she actually lived uh, mostly in front of the um, the Shoppers Drug Mart there on Bloor Street. Uh, a lot of people in the neighborhood would help her, which was a good thing. And um, due to the kindness of a uh, of a local musician, she ended up actually living her her final days in an old folks home. So it was much better than living on the street. So this is a song um, about, um, I happened to meet somebody who was um, from Nova Scotia and lived in the community oh, okay. where the Western Mine Disaster bye -bye. occurred. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> where the Western Mine Disaster occurred. You know, that was in 1992. And um, there was a company that was uh, running a very, very unsafe mine. Everybody knew it, but the government inspectors uh, you know, didn't really do anything about it. The government <coughs> didn't do anything about it. The miners were forced to uh, go to work anyway, even in these very unsafe conditions. And uh, it's, it's got to be the most hazardous job anyway. But uh, they were forced to work in a, in a mine that they knew it was quite a possibility that there would be an explosion. Eventually there was, and there were 26 miners killed. This is called the Ballad of West Ray. <coughs> <coughs> Sí. 
pigskin and whispering. Twenty-six miners toil <coughs> underground, <coughs> work in the mine from dusk till dawn. Another miner buried <coughs> in the ground. Twenty-six dead and whispering. Town closing down, mother kneels down to pray. Company boss says it's nobody's fault. Twenty six dead and whispering. Faces <coughs> flash on a TV screen. The whole world. Town closing down, mother kneels down to pray. <coughs> Nobody's fault, all the papers say, twenty six dead and whispering. The sun will shine, the rain will fall. The whole world must surely go on. Nobody's fault, all the papers say. Twenty six dead and whispering. Company town closing down. Mother kneels down. Says it's nobody's fault. Twenty six dead and whispering. Government man says it's nobody's fault. Twenty six dead and Letter, who is editor and federal secretary of social action? Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? Good. What are you doing? I teach history. You're going to get some now. <laughs> British North America was an economic backwater in the 17th and 18th centuries. Then domestic capital emerged and started to invest abroad. Canadian banks started in the Caribbean in the 1880s. They now dominate that region. During World War I, Canada industrialized, British power declined, and Canadian imperialism became a junior partner of American imperialism. <coughs> Canada is the world's 10th largest economy. It is a member of the OECD and the G8. It is one of the 10 top trading nations in the world. Despite huge concentrations of wealth, the average Canadian household is over $110,000 in debt. Over 14% of the people here live in poverty. Over 40% of Indigenous children do. Meanwhile, the Toronto Stock Exchange is the seventh largest in the world. Its 1,500 companies are worth over $2 trillion US. It is home to 60% of the mining companies on Earth. Canada is the, second, is the seventh biggest arms exporter. It's the second biggest supplier of weapons to the Middle East. And that includes, as many of you know, $15 billion in combat vehicles going to the reactionary rulers of Saudi Arabia. The Canadian state pushed development, starting with the dispossession of indigenous peoples by deepening the exploitation of labor and nature. The state is the public servant of private enterprise. It subsidizes the rich, 
Corporations strive to maximize private profit. The state serves up convenient tax laws, provides energy and transportation networks, plus cops and courts that steadfastly uphold the rights of big property owners over the interests of working people. The Canadian state, let's be clear, is no better or worse than the others. It obeys the laws of capitalism. It suppresses obstacles to the rule of big money. The same applies abroad. In Honduras, in Guatemala, Ecuador, Chile, and Colombia, Canadian mining giants like Gold Corp, Hud Bay, Graystar, Ascendant Copper, and Barrick Cold work with local authorities to crush popular opposition to pollution and the dispossession of farmers. Foreign policy is merely the extension of domestic policy. That explains why Ottawa was co-founder of NATO, the Cold War Alliance, why it sent troops to Korea, collaborated with the US in the war in Vietnam, and why Lester Pearson helped the imperialists save face in Suez, in Cyprus, and the Golan Heights. Never a peacemaker, always a powder monkey. Ottawa consistently voted with Washington at the UN. It did so, not as a neo-colony, but because the interests of our capitalist class coincide with theirs. Occasional divergences with the USA, such as over Petro-Canada or the Foreign Investment Review Agency, boosted the Canadian corporate elite. Since the, 1880, since the 1980s, free trade, privatization, and austerity are as Canadian and global as Tim Hortons. Make that a double-double. <laughs> so is foreign military intervention. The overthrow of Haiti's last democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, was plotted at Meech Lake. Canuck soldiers backed the coup in 2004, and Canuck cops remained part of the foreign military occupation of Haiti. Thousands of troops went to Afghanistan, and hundreds died there in vain. CF-18 jets bombed Libya to effect regime change resulting in devastation and ongoing violent chaos in that country. Is any of this changing under Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who calls himself a feminist? <laughs> Trudeau claims that Donald Trump's America is retreating from its role as the world cop. He says it's up to France, Germany, and Canada to fill the security vacuum. Security for whom, pray tell? Need I remind you, that the U.S. has 800 military bases in 70 countries around the world? How many bases has Trump closed? None. Not even the prison torture camp at Guantanamo. Oh yes, France has 10 military bases, Britain has seven, Canada has troops based in Iraq, in Latvia, in Ukraine, in Africa, and is sending hundreds again to Afghanistan. It has warships in the Persian Gulf and in the Mediterranean. But those forces cannot substitute for the power of the American empire. The fact is the empire is retreating from nowhere while Trudeau provides cover. The Pentagon and Wall Street continue to fund the right wing in Venezuela to try to overthrow the Maduro government. They continue to embargo revolutionary Cuba. They cheered as Trump hit Syria with 59 cruise missiles and exploded the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan. Or was it a I'm pausing for the photo, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Uh, and they applaud while Trump surrounds China with warships and threatens North Korea with nuclear weapons. Trump embraced the misogynist regime in Saudi Arabia and the Zionist apartheid state. Those client regimes those clients of U.S. hegemony give direct and indirect support to Daesh, ISIS, ISIL, whatever you want to call it. So what's new? Well, President Trump simply demands that his imperialist allies pay more of the freight. But Justin Trudeau, the feminist, promises an independent Canadian foreign policy. Yet he just capitulated to Trump. Or did he bow to Bay Street? He did so by boosting the budget of the Canadian military by 70%, the largest increase in its history. Shame. Uh -huh. Our Canada, our Canada, working class Canada, has completely different priorities. 
We demand home, homes, not bombs. <coughs> Free childcare, pharmacare, dental care, and university. We say, raise the welfare rates, tax the rich, slash military spending, compensate indigenous peoples, close the gender pay gap, and provide good jobs for all. Seize the assets of big oil and the banks to pay for a rapid green energy transition. It's the only way it'll, ha it'll happen. And to do that, of course, we need a planned economy, planned under workers and community control. In short, we need a revolution. I say this to you. The road to freedom, peace, and prosperity is the socialist revolution. Join Socialist Action tonight, and we'll get there sooner. And you know what? We'll have a hell of a lot of fun along the way. Performer is Mohamed Ali Amer, Comrade Socialist Hip Hop. Alright, anybody hear me? Yeah. Alright, Mohamed. Mohamed Ali, the socialist vocalist, uh, represents socialist hip hop, represents community worker programs, like that, you know. Um, yeah, so go by name, Mohamed. I rap about stuff that we've been talking about tonight. I'm so sorry for being late. Uh, I took a, a Greyhound for three hours from Niagara Falls. Um, it took four and a half hours instead of three hours. Um, lesson learned, take, take the go, because during rush hour, you can switch the train. But when I'm here, thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Social Hello. Action. Uh, and I'm gonna jump right into it. This Bravo. piece is called Democracy Now. If you wanna take photos, <coughs> videos, tag me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff, at Socialist Hip Hop. And it goes a little something like this. Would you send your future son out to Ferguson? Would you see the front line or be the first to run? Would you still battle if this battle won't be won? Ferguson, Ferguson, this goes out to Ferguson. Cause they got me putting red up on my visa. Tell you sky is the limit. They don't want to see us reach it. They want to keep us down. They want to keep it secret. The people united will never be defeated. All the way at the top, they don't see us. Champagne by the leaders, all my leaders is elitist. I'm sick of broken treaties. I'm sick of how they treat us. The people united will never be defeated. The power of the people stronger than people in power. They're powered by the people. We put those people in power. Hours turn to days, days into decades. Work eight to six, then raise my kid. I'm living in a debt age. They pay paradise, put up a parking lot. Johnny Mitchell never lied. Still, the block is hot. Pipelines from the barren seat. Pipes where the bear should be. We need solidarity. We need solid air to breathe. We won't weep if we reap what we sowed. We believe giving each equal peace. That's the goal. We don't steal. We don't scheme. They see us as drones. Machines worker bees for the queen on the throne. They say, this ain't no play on no game on no board when the stakes is your life. You take in what's yours. Money, power, respect, what my people call in. I mean, we making all this money, they just keeping all it. Money, power, respect. Money, power, respect. Money, power, respect. They just keeping all it. Would you send your future son out to Ferguson? Would you see the front line or be the first to run? Would you still rally if the battle won't be won? Ferguson, Ferguson, this goes out to Ferguson. Because they got me putting rent up on the visa. Tell you sky is the limit. They don't want to see us reach it. They want to keep us down. They want to keep it secret. The people united will never be defeated. All the way at the top, they don't see us. Champagne by the leaders. All my leaders is elitist. I'm sick of broken treaties. I'm sick of how they treat us. The people united will never be defeated. 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 Woo! I got one more piece for y'all and um, hmm. Um, we do a little anti-racism piece, you know what I'm saying? So uh, this one right here is called The Daughters of Asada. I started writing it with the passing of Brother Charlie Roach, a uh, great um, anti-racist activist in the city of Toronto. Kept writing in different forms. The final version I, I finished writing after the passing of Nelson Mandela. It's called The Daughters of Asada, and it goes a little something like this. We the sons of Madiba, the daughters of Asada. The sisters of Mumia, the brothers of Guevara. We the sons of Madiba, the daughters of Asada. Life of the script. I'm not an actor, but an author. We hear in one ear. Elders saying, yo, let's go. In the other ear, elders saying, yo, let go. Peddling hope, 
so we believe in going forward. Remind me why we heading overseas and getting tortured. They ain't speaking with the same voice. Truly, they never did. They jailing us with labels. What a clever trick to lock our mind in glass jars to contain us and detain us. Film those those bubbles of champagne and cocaine dust. Few understand what I'm talking about. For a rose that grew from concrete, still a flower that sprouts. Pac said that rose is stronger than the one from fresh meadows. And even he wondered, does heaven have a ghetto? Pac, Chris, public enemy, we char up these albums. For my generation, those the new Martin and Malcolms, less than time tested. Like sundown shadow makers, we don't trust in no mule or no 40 shallow acres. Cause we the sons of Madiba, the daughters of Asada. Sisters of Mumia, the brothers of Gerardo. We the sons of Madiba, the daughters of Asada. Life of the script, I'm not an actor but an author. In a grand circus, we chant verses and chant curses on your aunt's purchase. Cause damn it, our bank's worthless. We spit fan service, plan with a grand purpose. Mm. Then they ask us to jump like Mike, better or worse, twerk like Miley, big grin, <laughs> bug-eyed smiley. Cold spitters been turned to court jesters like a used car salesman talking about a chrome Lexus. For instance, the press appropriate our resistance. How you think a poor slave state is in existence doing dirty work for peanuts like pig pen? Dog, we wage in war against extinction. Yeah, Martin Luther King felt the marksman shooter sting, marking a future swing to a marketing super binge. I said, Martin Luther King felt the marksman shooter sting, marking a future swing to a marketing super binge because we're sons of Madiba, the daughters of Asada. Resistance in sonnets, no need to raise an armament to raise revolution. That's that Nat Turner. Don't need no gap burner because we pack the sojourner. Woo! Woo! <laughs> so, before I go real quick, one last little callback. I forgot to do it. So rock the video for Snapchat. Woo! When I say socialist, y'all say hip hop. Socialist, hip hop. Yeah. Socialist, hip hop. When I say Muhammad, y'all say Ali Muhammad. Ali. Muhammad. Ali. Peace, Snapchat. Peace, social action. Thank you so much. Bravo. Okay, folks. So before I open up the floor uh, to you, let's once again uh, thank all of our speakers and performers. Bravo. Bravo. for the cause, as they say, some advertising. Uh, Socialism in the Park, one of our events this summer socialist action, is putting on, is called Socialism in the Park, and it's three talks by socialist action leaders in Christie Pitt Park, so Christie and Bloor. And the first one is going to be Wednesday, July the 26th, The Origins of Class in the State. And you, I think you have the leaflets on your chair. Wednesday, August the 2nd, Permanent Revolutions, Stalinism and the Traditional Program. And August the 9th, Socialism in Canada, an introduction to socialism. So that's Socialism in the Park. It's coming up. You have your leaflets. And uh, it's a copy. Or we have a literature table outside. And this is the Socialist Action newspaper, the best uh, political paper in North America, in my opinion. And then we have a couple of booklet series you might be interested in is on our table. Quebec, Acadia, and Aboriginal peoples, or the Statements of Principles. OK. So now, it's time for you to join in the dialogue. What does the record of colonialism and capitalist rule say to you? What are the lessons and the tasks we face today? You may make a statement or ask a question. I will try to call, call on a balance of women and men to speak, and please try to make no more than three minutes. After this open discussion, I will present a resolution for this meeting to adopt. The resolution, I'll read it out, but it's there on the uh, blackboard. So I'm going to open it now for if people want to uh, have their say. I will take a speaker's list. Okay, it's too many ads going on. Okay, okay, I've got three so far. He hasn't. <laughs> Hello sisters and brothers. Yes, you notice that I have an accent, and you know that the working class in Canada has an accent. And no, forget it. Yeah. The socialism in Canada will have an accent. Right on. <laughs> Why? The socialism in Canada will have an accent because the immigrants, the new Canadians, bring their desire for a different, better world with them. The socialism in Canada will have an accent because these people, like me, bring their hatred and anger against the corrupt capitalist imperialist system. And they bring the experience <coughs> of working class struggle. And I'll tell you about my life story now in three minutes. 
No, only two now. <laughs> I was only six when I was recruited to the working class movement. My mom told me, you're not going to the school today, son. And I said, why, mom? Why? Because we're on strike. My father was a coal miner, and they were on strike. There were 30,000 more of uh, more of people like my father who were on strike, and they stopped working. So did the uh, uh, small business people in the city. The city stopped. So the employer said, all right, we will buy coal from abroad, from Austria and from uh, Romania. But what happened? The workers in Romania and Austria went to solidarity strike. They did not send coal to my hometown. In Turkey. In Turkey. And then I learned about the power of international working class struggle. I was only six. And I did not forget about that experience. When I was in, the, uh, uh, in my first year in university life, I was fast and furious then. We were drinking until midnight and talking about socialism. At 5 a.m. we were waking up, distributing leftists in factories, and then we were going to the anti-war rallies and we stopped. We stopped the Turkish parliament to allow the American state to use its military bases in Turkey during the first Iraq war. That was a huge victory, and I still remember that victory. And we built, we built on that victory when millions, millions of Turkish people went to the street and uh, protested against a corrupt leader, and we won. We won that struggle in 2013. I'm talking about the Gezi Park protest. And that protest is still with me, seconds. and it was with me when I was in the executive, uh, executive board of QP 3903, and we went, when we went on a strike and won the best collective agreement in the university sector in Canada. And comrades, we all together will build on such experiences. We will build on such anger against imperialism and corrupt capitalist system. And together, we will build, build on 150 years of resistance. And we will build the stairway to Socialist Canada together. Thank you. Well, I just want to express my appreciation for all the presenters tonight. I think together they made it a most wonderful and inspiring evening. And it's given us food for thought and food for our hearts as well. So that's basically what I wanted to say. It's been really wonderful. I have a few questions. Um, I, I guess uh, for Carrie, uh, during the uh, recent celebrations, a lot of people kind of myth that the TP was erected. And I guess some right wing people would say, like, well, the leadership hasn't really been helping the community or the indigenous people. And, and, and I know that we need to ally with uh, Aboriginal people as as we try to deal with like environmental degradation, like Trump's gonna do harm to the planet, I get that impression. Uh, I guess for Barry, uh, Trudeau seems to be like kissing up to Trump. He's not saying anything stupid to push him <coughs> off. Uh, Harjit Sajjan wants to spend like seven billion dollars more on, I think, American jet fighters and other weaponry, and, and even a lot of the uh, American uh, House seats have ties with the military, so they have, have to keep expanding their wars to make more money because that's just one of the ways that these capitalists think that you can grow an economy. But uh, in Canada, I think there's a lot more guys that say living in their parents' basement playing video games, and, and I think that they're proposing like public works like infrastructure projects to get people working and, and maybe making a living or a life and I'm wondering if uh, meaningful work is, is a way to get out of I guess uh, a spinning your wheels kind of situation so uh, I don't think we're that anti-immigrant like the Americans are because uh, well, apparently Canadian uh, born women aren't having enough babies so the only way to fill that uh, labor gap is through immigration. Like We have an aging population now, so uh, I think that there'll be more people involved in, in the healthcare field. And, and maybe if they do uh, spend more money on uh, childcare, then there'll be more early 
talented Second. educators, which would probably be predominantly women. And, and I support what the uh, Workers Action Center, Dean Aladdin, and those people have done, pushing for a uh, higher minimum wage, specifically in Ontario. I think next year it's going to go up to 14%, to $14, and the year after that will be 15 but that's still not enough to really survive in right. the city of Toronto. So uh, I hope that we can keep uh, raising these issues because uh, people shouldn't have to live in bus Fine. shelters because they're poor. I'm going to come to Terry first and then to Barry for the answers to these questions. Uh, and you each have up to three minutes. Because okay. they were asking about the uh, governance um, not being happy with the TP erecting. I'm not sure, are you meaning the Canadian governance or the uh, fan council type governance? I think uh, people were upset that uh, TP was allowed to be up on Parliament Hill so close, and then the attack would be, well, why don't they do a better job of their own community leadership? Okay, um, I think if, if they had not allowed for the uh, that TV to be erected, um, and it was the Canadian government that actually moved it up closer to the, uh, to the, uh, to the stage, um, they know that there would have been more people, more Indigenous and allies streaming in there uh, and, and causing uprisings across the country. So as some of the uh, um, land defenders there were saying, um, do you want this to lead to another OCA? Um, so this kind of thing just, just infuriates First Nations people. This is um, the, the land around Ottawa is uh, unceded indigenous land, disputed between the Algonquin and, and the, uh, the Haudenosaunee, uh, but still it's all indigenous land. So to be told that you can't have that uh, TV in place there would have just um, uh, would have been a slap in the face and anger would have uh, erupted. Okay, thank you, Kim. Barry, just three minutes. Public works, yes. But 3P, no. Let me explain what I mean. Um, infrastructure in this country, uh, the bridges, the roads, the, the, the uh, the ports on the Great Lakes and on the on the two ocean, the three oceans, are falling apart. But uh, there's no uh, plan to repair or improve those facilities, which are important and, and good job creators for good for good social purposes. The government says it's going to implement an infrastructure plan. Well, we'll see. It's not reflected in the budget as yet. But the goal of the government in terms of establishing an infrastructure plan, they've made it plain, is to privatize public facilities. They're talking about 3P. That means a partnership between the public and the private sector. Public-private partnership. And the goal that the, the government has is to intrude into the public sector and alienate as much of it as possible, at least those parts of the infrastructure that can be profitable to the private sector by going into partnership and then, of course, easing the public role out and the predominance of private ownership. That means less control of the economy, less control of our uh, destiny. Childcare, yes, urgently needed. This has been a proposal, a pledge, by liberal uh, election manifestos and by the li previous liberal government under Paul Martin and predecessors for decades and generations. There was a plan negotiated with the provinces, but as, but, but as Stephen Harper and the Tories took, took control of, in Ottawa, they, they, they quashed it. What, what's in store? What kind of child care plan will, will, will be offered? That too remains to be seen. There's no clear indication that it will be public quality child care rather than a subsidy to um, private providers in, in homes where there is not adequate supervision and enforcement of standards. So that's very problematic. But there's one more highly problematic aspect, and that's the wages for people who have training as early childhood educators, the child care workers. They're being paid across this country almost uni uniformly below the minimum wage. And that is absolutely scandalous that this government and this system regard the people in whose trust parents place their children the, the, the most valuable asset of any, of any society uh, with, with workers who are paid so miserably. That has to be addressed, and there's no hint of it. There's no hint of it in the federal government's program. And finally, precarious work, which really you know, subsumes all of these issues. 
What's needed is a crash program, not only to convert from carbon-based to green energy, not only to repair the infrastructure, not only to provide childcare and to slash the military budget to do it, and to make sure the rich pay their taxes, but also to redistribute the work. There's plenty of work, but we have a system where people, um, uh, the work is concentrated in relatively few hands, and more and more people are getting part-time uh, and, and, and precarious work the, 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 the jobs that are 40 hours a week should be 30 hours a week with no cut in wages and pay to redistribute the work, especially to young people who need that first experience, who need a job, who need to be able to have money to put a roof over their head and bread on the table. Thank you. Uh, Mark, is Judy there because she had her hand up and she disappeared on the Another question. Yeah, I know that, but Judy was the next on the list. Okay, Judy, go ahead. Uh, yeah, when I was growing up, there was no Medicare <coughs> in Canada. And, uh, and, that, and uh, ever since Medicare came in, there's been constant, uh, constant tr uh, attempts to, uh, to decrease the amount of of Medicare available right from the beginning, and now it's getting to a point where uh, where it's again becoming precarious. Like it's becoming uh, if we, if this continues much longer, there will be Medicare in Canada again. I know it's it's uh, so we have to, that's something we that's something we have to fight for, including former care and dental care. Here, here. Right. And uh, that's the only way that the Medicare will continue. Okay, thank you, comrade. Thank okay, you. sister. Okay, you're next. Uh, so my question is for some of the speakers that come from indigenous communities. Um, so I found that going out to certain events more recently, you're finding a lot of speakers opening with saying, we'd like to acknowledge that we're on such and such land. So I'm from KW, so it's uh, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe land. And personally, when I try to imagine myself as an indigenous person hearing that, it kind of just sounds like lip service um, at best. And I just wanted to get the perspective of people from indigenous communities on um, what you feel about about those kinds of addresses. Okay, Carrie, you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I think most of us have uh, left already. There's some triggering going on with the women that were in front of me. Um, yeah, it's definitely lip, lip service, but at the same time, it's an acknowledgement that has not been there until now. Um, so that for, the, for people to be acknowledging it uh, is, is almost unbelievable that that's taking place. But it does need to go on beyond that and go further than that. Um, where one of the things that's being looked at is the um, uh, restitution of crown lands back to indigenous peoples. Um, so there needs to be action along with it. So words are one thing, but actions are another. Mm -hmm. And to stop um, trailing and surveilling and uh, calling terrorists, uh, First Nations people who stand up for rights that should be already in place. Now, the Canadian government and the American government and in fact governments around the world who uh, are on occupied, who have occupied lands of indigenous peoples, um, they never expected the indigenous peoples to still be alive today. So they're dealing with that uh, fact that they are still having to deal with the people. And uh, so they're coming around to it by you know, at least acknowledging the lands and things hopefully, well, I don't even like the word hopefully, but um, because of that movement um, and because of the, the rise, I mean, there's, every generation seems to have a rise of, of the peoples from the grassroots and up. So, you know, in the 60s, we certainly had that. In the 20s, we had that. All, all through, there's been times when people have stood up to say, hey, enough is enough. And this is yet one more time of enough is enough with I Don't Know More and other movements that are taking across the land. So, lip service, yes. Actions to follow. Or actions will follow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My name is Sandra, the first time I've been here to listen to your uh, groups. Um, I'm Cree First Nation. And what I've heard so far from, from some of the members of the Socialist Action Group is a call to join your group. 
Now, I don't know exactly what your, your, uh, your plan of action is. However, back in the day, I'm quite old, as you can see. I'm older than some of you. Um, I've heard the same sort of call uh, to bring inclusivity and diversity. It's just great, though. Don't get me wrong. It's great. It's wonderful. We had a wonderful, uh, wonderful panel. It was very diverse. And, you know, a lot of different people were included. Um, however, again, just going back to my main question, the socialist action, there was two calls, two different people called 